Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We uh, have another exciting topic here at the uh, Capgemini stage. Uh, we have the topic of CRISP manufacturing enabled by data-driven planning. For those of you that aren't familiar with CRISP, it is connected, resilient, and robust, intelligent, sustainable, people-centric. Easy as that. Uh, I have three folks to introduce to you today. We have uh, Gunter Beitinger uh, from Siemens. Uh, we have Klaus Wigner, as well as Gunnar Ebner. So I definitely tested my American accent there, so hopefully I got most of them out okay. But uh, we have Klaus actually will be joining us remotely, but here on the stage, I'd like to welcome both Gunter and uh, Gunnar onto the stage. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. So it's a pleasure uh, for us uh, to have Gunter with us on stage because he's uh, leading, I think, a lighthouse factory network uh, at Siemens Digital Industries and where he developed the concept about crisp manufacturing. I let him to introduce the concept first because it's a great uh, idea how to manage networks in a, I would say, volatile and, and complex uh, value chain world. Uh, then I think uh, we presenting uh, what we doing, uh, working with Gunther and his team for enabling uh, crisp manufacturing as a resilient and intelligent network for capacity planning, for production planning, and as an outlook what we can do to manage the entire supply chain with a data-driven, with a hardcore data-driven approach and with some large-scale mathematical optimization. And uh, our, our third colleague, uh, uh, Klaus, will be joining remote because his wife is expecting the second baby, so he's on standby. <laughs> but uh, stay tuned for the presentation, and I would like to hand it over to Gunther. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, to you the, the crisp manufacturing narrative. Uh, before we are going into the deep dive uh, with Klaus, I would like to set a little bit the stage what we are challenging in our network. And of course, I think many times you have heard this, we are at the moment in a VUCA world, no? so volatile and uncertainties. And uh, there are, of course, several challenges uh, with this uh, uh, geopolitical circumstances. You are, uh, when you're looking into small and medium companies, especially the digitalization has just begun, but then the next challenging is coming with the introduction of AI, for example. And uh, the increased importance of sustainability. Sustainability is not anymore just something you do beside or is done by a certain organization. It must be part of any process, of any activity. Uh, this is of course, what are the society and, of course, a lot of governments already are asking for. And uh, last but not least, uh, longing for the next innovation is something which keeps companies competitive. And so us, we need to be competitive. And when I'm looking especially also to Germany or to the European countries, then we have an additional challenge is where do we get the workforce from, especially skilled workforce. And demographic challenges are coming. We have new people standing in front of our factories expecting a completely life balancing, so putting the work with private life together. So there are different challenges what we have. And what is our answer to be competitive is that we have developed a narrative which we call CRISP. First of all, it is nice to remember, so it's good for communication. Crisp, hey, we are a crisp uh, network, so everybody wants to be crisp. No? And, but every letter stands for something which we in focus, which we are putting much focus on. So especially when we are talking about a network, and which goes down on a factory level and then on a production line level, we say everything needs to be connected. So the, the machines, the assets, needs to be connected to the shop floor so that the information and the data collected are dashboarded for our people, for our shop floor people, so that they can derive information and then 
act actions from that. And this information needs to be, of course, prepared. But also it gives us insights into our processes so that we can improve them continuously. But also connected to the cloud. We need the power of the cloud so that we can train models. But also we need the data in the cloud so that we can connect our factories in between so that, can, that we can learn from each other and exchange this information. And this is what we see then later also in an example. That's just a short example of what is C, but we have it, of course, more detailed. R stands for resilience and robustness. So when we look into our supply chain, we need to design them from a resilient perspective. So we need transparency along the supply chain. But also, when we are talking about resilience, it can be done by design. For example, when there is a shortage on a component, do you already have a second component already in your system? Or do you need the whole engineering circle? So we have alternative components already now in our system. So if there is a shortage, it takes us just a few minutes to switch. And we have the component then in our bill of material and in our test system. But robustness is another R. Our processes need to be robust. If you are not robust, you don't know which you, what you're getting out. So robust process design is absolutely uh, important. And for this, we introduce our classic lean management. What does the I mean? I is, of course, intelligence. And we are thinking about artificial intelligence. We are introducing already AI on a larger scale into our factories. We already have production. Uh, we have AI already productive, especially in the quality uh, management system, because we believe when we are looking on electronic production, 40% of our activities are related to quality. AI can definitely change and support us to reduce the effort here. And why is AI so important for everything what we're doing? Because first of all, it will the, change the cost structure of our products, definitely. And it's universal usable. So we can introduce it on one production line and in another system into another factory. And we have an infrastructure already that we can implement it. And this is why this AI for us is so important. And it will be really be a game changer. And then when we look on the S, the sustainability, sustainability needs to be thought holistically. Of course, the most of the activities when you look into companies are coming that they are introducing photovoltaic, that they maybe are uh, um, buying renewable energies uh, and uh, making local um, um, energy reduction projects. And that's very important. But for us also, uh, sustainability along the supply chain is very, uh, uh, very important because the most of the carbon emission when, when, when we are looking into our products are generated in the supply chain. And for this, we developed a solution called Seagreen, which is tracking the carbon along the supply chain and exchange the data on a trustworthy and trustful way. And then last but not least, the P. The P is for people centricity. The people, what we are having in our factories, are challenged in compared with the past with new innovations seven times higher than when we are looking 30 years back. So you, we are introducing new technology seven times faster than in the past. And that means that, means that our people need to be re uh, uh, retrained and skilled accordingly to the technology we are introducing. Otherwise, we are not getting the power on the shop floor, let's say. And the people need to stay longer in our factories. So especially when we're looking into our um, country here, yeah, 67. So we need to take care that these people are physically and mentally healthy and capable so that they can fulfill their responsibilities. But also, how we are learning in our factories has changed. We are addressing micro-learning concepts which are can immediately consumed on our production lines. As an example, so that uh, the people have more uh, 
freedom and, and, and independently they can choose when and where they would like to learn. Just a glimpse of that, what we are doing. Um, now, pulling out one important example is the network coordination. So if we would like, uh, as I said, our markets are volatile. So if we have a demand on one market, let's say in Europe, and uh, we would like to, to deliver the products uh, in the time our customer would like to have them, sometimes, of course, we are having not the capacity installed in this factory. So we would like to use a capacity from other factory. Even if our production is set up that we are local for local, so market-oriented production, we call this. So by this, we have anyway redundant um, um, production lines and, and machines which are producing the same uh, product, but for the a market there in China for China and in, in Germany for the Europe and rest of the world. And, but our markets are more volatile at the moment. So that means how can we use the capacity, what we have maybe um, available in one factory for another. That sounds very easy. On a general level, yeah, there is free shifts, but on a production line and a technical level, it's getting very, very complicated. So this means, are the product already introduced on the production line? Is the material available? Can they produce it? As then maybe the, 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 the assets are not from the same technology uh, level, so one line is faster than the other. And for this, we, we have uh, worked in a project together with Capgemini to introduce the digital, the digital data platform and data-driven platform, which faces the challenges, the network coordination, the network configuration, and brings this then all together. Using and really improving the local factories, so every factory has a knowledge base, of course, but if it is necessary, fast, and immediate use the possibilities of the network so that we can react to a demand of one market, maybe with additional capacity from another. And uh, Klaus has uh, worked this with us out, and he will now introduce it on more detail, how the algorithm and how it is uh, working. Thank you. Hello, Klaus. <laughs> Hello, thank you. <laughs> Oh, okay. I have an echo. You have an echo? What? No, it's okay. So, can you can hear me here? I'm... Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear okay, you. Okay, I will handle this. So, thanks for um, yeah allow allowing me <laughs> to present our project here. Um, greetings to Hannover. I'm sitting here in my home office, as um, Gona mentioned, in Cologne. Okay, um, so we did a quantitative approach to solve these network uh, problems. And this means that we need to, to be able to to calculate with um, capacities, and um, luckily there's a good way how to do this. Uh, so the objective of our calculation is: first, we need a model of this of the supply chain of the production capacities, the local ones distributed over the world. We need to have an idea on the time dimension of the problem. In this case, the classical production plan for, uh, for um, DI is a 24-month horizon uh, plan on a, on a monthly uh, basis. And uh, we need to be able to um, see and to understand the domino effects that occur within this production network over time and space uh, when taking um, local production um, decisions. And uh, what is the target from the mathematical point of view of this of this computation is is to find a, um, a balance between the demand on the one side and the available capacity of the other side. This is a very high level uh, uh, setting, of course, uh, satisfying the quality uh, criteria for the um, Siemens planning experts. And during our interviews and workshops, we identified um, quite the standard. 
um, uh, logistics, KPIs, such as, of course, the punctuality, the production costs, inventory holding costs, and so on. But um, also, as usual in similar projects, we identified very specific um, uh, um, expectations towards a good um, production plan, for example, as far as concerned with leveling of, of certain um, products, um, or and uh, as the production, the co-production, the simultaneous production of several products um, uh, in, um, in terms of a better uh, market visibility. So we were able to understand and to formalize all these requirements. This is a data science um, point of uh, view. So we modeled is as an algebraic model, um, a large scale optimization model and used um, appropriate um, solution algorithms um, to come up with solutions that iteratively then um, were improved, uh, that satisfied the expectations of the planners. The way towards this prototype and this solution was also paved by statistical analysis of the as-is um, process with historical data, of course, and some iterations of the, of the network model itself. But in essence, it is a, um, a classical production model with certain customer specific, for example, convex um, um, elements that made also from the analytical point of view, the model very um, interesting from our side. You might ask what is the benefit of such a model compared to maybe standard. We consider this now as a, as a fully customized uh, network model for the purpose of Siemens. What is the most what are the major benefits um, with respect maybe to standard solutions such as IBP or OMP or other competitors? And this would be first of all that the model is very accurate and um, solves very fast now. Um, uh, it has of course the uh, KPIs that you can see on the right side. We reduced um, the backlog. This was a very um, important requirement. We uh, reduced the inventory costs. But I would say this is also what other models, standard models, are able to do. Um, but first of all, we feel, really fulfill the, the expectations of the planners, especially for the Siemens-specific requirements, for the patterns that they want to see in a good quality plan. Um, but more importantly, which maybe pays on the P element of um, Gunther's uh, CRISP, um, the people centricity, um, due out, uh, by our discussions with the planners, we had the feeling that we could start launching a process to think about production capacity in a new way. Um, just by the terminology that we introduced into the discussion and the, the maybe a little bit formal approach, so the, we needed to have a full understanding, a clear understanding of key concepts as what exactly is the production capacity? How do you define it? And um, how can you compute it with it? Um, I, we could observe a more transparency on already in the minds of the planners, a better understanding of all these complex interactions. And this was also from our side, the most um, uh, um, fruitful um, result to see that we would we started seeing, uh, speaking the same language. Next slide, please. Because what is the next step um, immediately? So now we are able to do a production plan um, on the network, um, uh, which satisfies very detailed uh, requirements. But um, speaking of uncertainties, this is, um, of course, one of the major questions. So how do you deal with your model when things are changing? And we distinguish, in principle, between two types of uncertainties. The ones, one type is those who are not known in advance. Um, the unknown unknowns and the other ones who are more or less known in advance, such as statistical fluctuations about certain demand lead times, for example. We need to be able to quantify um, this, the impact of uncertainties on a local part on the whole plat on the whole network. This is also, a, a, from an analytics point of view, a very interesting um, question. And we have a, a solution for this called our Guardian, which is able to do a stress test on the supply chain, on Siemens production um, supply chain, Siemens production network, uh, which is able to do two types of uh, events uh, on, this, uh, on this uncertainty space. First of all, the ones that are known or anticipated uh, by the risk managers, such as what might be the impact of more political tensions in the US versus China with a particular focus on Taiwan. We discussed certain scenarios in, in a in, in some discussions with our customer. 
these are important enough to um, to quantify and to run um, the simulation of these uh, such events to study uh, the um, the output or the, the decreased output or the impact of such um, um, events on um, uh, on the concrete uh, situation. But the other ones are not to underestimate those who are not even currently able to be anticipated. Who would have anticipated the situation that we are in today? I, I think it's a uh, honest answer to say nobody would have given a probability of the type of crisis that we are living right now um, uh, um, that they would ever have occurred. And so the model here is able also to deal with uh, non-probabilistic events and does a pure combinatoric um, 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 exploration of combinations of possible events with the result of an identification of the vulnerable points of the supply chain and the production networks. This is the core of this uh, of this analysis, and uh, this is also based on um, academic research uh, where the risk exposure index and the time to survive KPIs uh, show very benefit or are beneficial. So in concrete terms, uh, we get as an outcome, first of all, a cluster uh, realization of um, the vulnerable points of the supply chain. And also here, compared to maybe classical risk management uh, methodologies, this algorithm is able to um, take into account the domino effects, the propagation effects within the network of certain local events, and most importantly also the ability to recover as fast as possible to the, or to the nominal situation after a disturbance has happened. So this is based on mathematical optimization as well. Um, it's a re-optimization by changing boundary conditions in a massive stress test scenario and then doing statistical analysis of the results. And the key is to discover um, 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 uh, uh, vulnerabilities that have not been known um, before by the, by the risk managers that are maybe a part of the path of the critical um, 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 supplies um, that still have an impact, uh, a major impact for certain regions, or at least during certain time intervals of production. And um, the second benefit, um, apart from this uh, map of vulnerabilities, um, is certainly to readjust um, um, safety levels, safety stock levels, because the as is computation of these um, safety levels is based on heuristics and on assumptions of um, market demand that um, are maybe not always fulfilled, especially in a network settings with the possibility of balancing um, as, as is the this key design of our network. And um, this um, our stress test, of course, takes into account these network effects and then is able to identify over and under stocks and re give a new transparent view a network centric view on the on the right calibration of the safety um, stock that's it from our analytics uh, point of view next slide please and back uh, to gunther yeah, thank you thank you klaus for the insight and uh, to sum it up what we want to reach with this is of course that our network is more resilient and we can act very very fast on changing demands and use the capacity we have available in our factories uh, so that it uh, that we can fulfill of course the customer's uh, wish when a product needs to be delivered so thank you very much we are uh, klaus and uh, yeah and hope Everything goes fine. <laughs> uh, that you don't have to wait too long now anymore. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and of Thank course, your wife also. <laughs> Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, are there any questions? We have a couple minutes if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, a round of applause. We have a question over here. Hold on. There you are. Yes, uh, one question. You mentioned that the algorithm could be smart one. So uh, how did the algorithm, or is, it, it's, is it scaled to learn from scenarios after yeah. the probability is known that an event occurs? Is the algorithm improving itself and the model getting better and better like this? Or how did you design this? I didn't get it. I think Klaus needs to answer this. Yeah. Yes, so it's a... It's about the, the, the stress test um, 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 question. The current one is really a, a basic way. It's just uh, uh, 
we have a multi-stage um, uh, model of, 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 our, of our production network and we solve it um, currently um, by a sequence of deterministic um, um, and linear um, 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 programs. So this is a really a simplistic starting point, but what you ask about the learning and the trajectory and the sequentiality of, of uh, uh, this type of decision, um, uh, we can uh, um, uh, certainly um, uh, go into this probabilistic um, network and improve the current one. But the current one is just based on linear programming. Great. All right. Well, I think that's uh, our time for today. Thank you again, all three of you gentlemen. Appreciate it. Have a good rest of the fair. Thank you.